Welcome to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. the alternate history podcast don and alexis both joining you today for a little episode today we're going to do something that we have not spent a tremendous amount of time prepping so i'm just going to let the audience know right up front this is going to be one of those on the fly top of the head kind of things but i I did do some prep work ahead of this episode Uh, but i really wanted alexis to come into this episode without the prep work to sort of uh have just fresh ideas about what was going on. So Alexis, how do you feel about little bitty boxes that you get into that you push buttons on that go up and down? Uh, I think they have their place. I like taking the stairs every once in a while, but when I need to get someplace fast, getting in that little box, pressing that button, it's a, it's a good thing. Okay, and the very fact that I did not say the E word elevator when I was describing what it is, but Alexis knew what I meant. Now, partly she knew what I meant because she knew what the topic of today's uh, episode is going to be, but tells you that elevators are everywhere. They are ubiquitous. They are sometimes frustrating. Yeah. Uh, They are people I know have fears of them for various reasons. Uh, But I think it's a fair thing to say that it's hard to imagine a modern world Without without them. Uh, for all kinds of reasons. So, uh, what is your favorite thing about elevators, Alexis? Oh, goodness. My favorite thing about elevators would probably be... Actually, you know what I really like about elevators, and I've had it happen to me a couple times in, in workplaces, is when you can skip floors in elevators. And the elevator doesn't go to all the floors in the building. It saves time, and it gets you to where you need to go a lot faster. Okay. Um, and especially in taller buildings, you may have banks of elevators that only go to certain floors, so it's easier to get there. Or I know I've visited client offices where there's a unique elevator that goes directly to their lobby and their lobby only, and then you transfer over. Uh, so that type of thing. What is your least favorite thing about elevators? Least favorite thing would probably be, and this has changed a little bit, although we're kind of going back to how it was maybe maybe pre pre COVID. But least favorite thing is usually in an elevator, you have a lot of people trying to get in the elevator and you're kind of crammed together. Again, that's that's changed a little bit. I know a lot of elevators I've been in recently had capacity restrictions and things like that, but those are easing. So I think we're going back towards that kind of, let's pack as many people as we can in this little moving box. Right, right. So uh, people I know, other things that they don't like about elevators is waiting on them, either at their floors or waiting on them where they are. Um... Uh, many of you know, especially if you listen to the other episode that we did on this, that Alexis is a uh, a connoisseur, a encyclopedia of knowledge about the uh, television sitcom Friends. Joey's character on Days of Our Lives, that would be Dr. Drake Ramore. How did he die? He, he falls down an elevator shaft. Falls down an elevator shaft. And so you do occasionally hear stories about elevator accidents mishaps. and mishaps. But uh, I mentioned that I bring that up just sort of in the intro here, in a, in a fictional sense and a sitcom sense, in that really the the story of other than people being trapped in elevators or stuck it being stuck in elevators um, really does tend to be something unless it's a a situation regarding a fire or some situation like that where obviously it's an issue. Um, but really, most of the time when you hear about elevator mishaps, the elevator mishaps that you hear about for the most part are fictional and not real. Yeah, I was about to say, I think I can probably, I definitely can count on one hand the amount of real elevator mishaps that I know of, but in in fiction, it's countless. Yeah, so as you might have guessed, we're going to be talking today about elevators, and so our we're what-if podcast, so we're not just going to talk about elevators, we're going to talk about a what-if that relates to elevators, and so the what-if is going to be simply that, what if there were no, no... Elevators. Elevators in the modern sense, and let me clarify that. Because the idea of using lifts and hoists goes back literally for thousands of years. I'm talking about the modern passenger elevator. 
And so when we come back from the break, we're going to set this up a little bit by talking about how we have some of the things that we enjoy today. Why you see the name Otis on some elevators. Where does that come from and what is that about? But also we're going to talk about the historical what if of what if there were no passenger elevators. We'll be right back after the break. Hi there, guys. This is Alexis and... Don. Taking a little break from the podcast to tell you about one of our favorite things, and that is what, Dad? That's Audible. And uh, What does Audible do? Audible does everything. At least it does everything when it comes to playing audio programming for you. So that's... uh, I typically think of it as being audio books, but it's not just books. It can be periodicals, magazines, uh, theatrical productions, podcasts even now. Uh, Just anything that you can imagine that is audio can come through Audible. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, We, of course, love We Are Avid Readers, both Dawn and myself. So, But we like to be lazy sometimes with our reading. We like to be read, too. So that's where Audible comes in. And if you're like us and you like reading, but maybe want to try being read, too, for a change, we have a little deal for you to check out Audible. What's that deal? The deal is uh, an opportunity for you to get a one-month free subscription to Audible, which comes with one credit. A credit is how you purchase, again, an audio book, uh, an audio program, whatever the case might be. And so if you follow the uh, either the, the link that's in our show notes or go to www.audibletrial.com slash a fork in time, you'll be connected there. You can see how to sign up. And again, you'll get that one month at no charge, a chance to try it, see if you like it. And uh, you'll also get one credit. Uh, which will go towards, again, an audio purchase. That could be a book, fiction, nonfiction, whatever it might be. And I guess the other thing to mention, Lex, is what happens if you also happen to be an Amazon Prime member? That means you actually get two credits. And as we get into the holiday season, I'm sure a lot of people are taking advantage of Amazon Prime. So take advantage of this, too. If you're an Amazon Prime member, you actually get two credits with this deal instead of one. So maybe two books. Yeah, two books. Or or that way you can check out different variety. You may, you may choose a fiction and nonfiction genre, for example, to see how you like that. One of the things I know that Alexis and I often talk about is sometimes a great reader can actually make a good book even better. Even better. And uh, a lot of the productions now, the audio books and other audio programs are done by excellent readers. And I know for me, I can think of some of my favorites, don't want to belabor them here, but uh, sometimes they can bring a whole new life into something you may have even already read before by hearing it spoken. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So we encourage you to take advantage of that offer. Again, that's a, a link in the show notes. Uh, on our on our website or go to www, www.audibletrial.com slash a fork in time. Thanks. Welcome back to A Fork in Time, the Alter History Podcast. Don and Alexis joining you today. We've taken out the two-seat version of the A Fork, a fork in Time What If machine. Uh, we're going to explore a technology what if. So remind our listeners, Alexis, what that technology is. Elevators. Elevators. And specifically, we're talking about passenger elevators yes. here. And so the modern passenger elevator has a history that actually goes back just slightly more than 100, in fact, almost right at now about 160 to 170 years. Yeah, that seems way further back than I thought it was. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, one of the things we talked about briefly off podcast, and again, I brought Alexis into this topic without having her been being aware of what the topic was going to be. So she's sort of coming along for the ride with you to interject her thoughts here. But I wouldn't have guessed, I wouldn't have guessed the 1850s. No. I would have guessed a little bit later than that. I knew by the turn of the century uh, it had come along, and I knew that it was there because of the rise of skyscrapers. Uh, But I, I wouldn't have guessed as early as 1853, where something really, really important happens. In 1853, there's a World's Fair in New York. And at most of the World's Fairs, a number of things are introduced or exhibited for the first time at World's Fairs. And it just so happens that in 1853, at the New York World's Fair, uh, for the first time, what is demonstrated is what's known as the safety elevator. So... I see the expression on Alexis's face. What pops into your head when you hear the safety elevator? Um, it, it's a little concerning that they have to really emphasize the point that it's safe. I think I think that is the point. 
Because, in fact, elevators had existed, or lifts or hoists of various types, had existed prior to 1853. But the reason that they were used almost exclusively to move items and not people was the simple fact that they weren't necessarily considered safe. safe. If a rope were to break, or if something were to happen in the pulley system, or if something were to happen in the counterbalance system that was in place for these things, many of them were... Also not mechanical. A number of them up until that point had been um, been hand-drawn. Although we're now in the age of the Industrial Revolution here in, by the 1850s, and so it's possible to use mechanical means for here. But they were they were elevators existed, but they were used for freight. And the reason was there was a concern that it was not a safe way to transport a... Human? A human, a person. And the reason was, again, as I just mentioned, if something happened where a cable broke, or in that case, more often a rope were to break, uh, then suddenly the elevator would go... Crashing. Crashing down, downward at a high speed. And by the way, gravity is uh, nothing to be messed with or nothing, nothing to be trifled with. And so even a short distance, even a drop of what at that time may have been two, three, four stories, would have been pretty substantial. 30, 40, 50 feet, a drop suddenly... Uh, someone could not only be uh, be hurt, but somebody could be killed. And in fact, there were freight elevators that w- were in warehouses all over the place in the early days of the Industrial Revolution. And in fact, uh, sort of the hero of our story here is Elisha Otis. And uh, Otis, who is uh, in his uh, late 30s, early, I guess moving towards the age of uh, 40 here, a little bit beyond 40, has uh, worked in uh, factories. And so he's seen and he's interacted with freight elevators before. And he had an experience where he was unloading or removing some things from an upper story to a lower story using the freight elevator and sort of wanted to actually ride down or was thinking about riding down as, as, as the stories describe, but didn't trust doing so because he had seen problems. The, he had seen the, the elevator, the rope elevators break. And so he uh, actually worked on developing a way to create a safety mechanism that came to be known as the Otis Safety Brick. And so he demonstrates the Otis safety break at the 1953 New York World's Fair. 1853. 1853, thank you. 1953, this would have been less of a, uh, this would have been less of a, uh, uh, would have been less of an an accomplishment, probably. Uh, We invented elevators and we're going to space. So, uh, but, uh, so he, what he demonstrates there is uh, basically a platform that's like what most people are, comp- you know, again, we don't, again, the, the idea of the elevator as a box also is also not the case for a freight elevator. These were often just flat platforms that were lowered up and down. Think of them as massive dumbwaiters, if you will, that you could put. <laughs> yeah, that's what I have in my head. Yeah. And so he demonstrates standing on a platform where you could actually see the rope, which is what was suspending there. And with him standing on it and standing of it high enough above the crowd that he was noticeable, Someone, an axeman, actually cut the rope, and the elevator drops briefly, but then suddenly stops. And the reason it stops is the safety brake mechanism uh, that he had devised that would cause, basically, in, in the tracks or on the side, without going into a lot of detail about this, I'll certainly put some links in the show notes so you can see the things there, but would, would create this tension-based brake that would, that would expand itself and cause the elevator to just stop. So, yes, you may be stuck. Yes, you may not be where you want to be, but you're not going to... Fall completely to the ground. Yeah. And people were astonished by this. But also suddenly realized, uh, and this was the case over the next couple of years, as as this invention, this patent was, was carried forward and, and the Otis Elevator Company came into being, that people had confidence of actually getting on elevators as a passenger device uh, because they knew that they had the protection of the safety brake that was there. And so as a result of the invention of the safety brake break, um, and other innovations that came after that in elevator technology, elevators came to the forefront. So what are the things or some of the things that elevators make possible? Well, we've already mentioned skyscrapers. Of course, when you have the ability to um, get to a lot of floors quickly, you're able to build more of those floors. It makes a little more sense for you to do that. Um, also, and I think we're going to get into this very, very quickly, it allows, um, a lot more people to be put into a lot, put into a smaller space because, again, you're able to build more stories on top of each other, so you're not having to expand out as, um, 
horizontally in places anymore. You can go vertically all of a sudden with yeah. the elevator. So just just knowing what you know about, let's just say, I know Alexis will know something about this. Let's say 19th century London, the early part of the 19th century. What would have been a quote unquote tall building? I mean, a, a tall building in, you know, 19th century London would have been maybe five stories. <laughs> five or six stories. And the reason is you would not want to have climbed more than that. Now, there were there were cathedrals and bell towers and other things like that, again, that you accessed by stairs. But in terms of where... Or those dumbwaiter system. Yeah, right. But in terms of where somebody would actually, on a daily basis, work or right. live... Right. The, the limit was really about that. You're talking about five to six stories being a... A tall building. A tall building. And certainly not a, a that that would have been pushing the limits of what tall was. So do you have any idea how tall the first skyscraper was, Lex? I'm gonna be conservative. I'm gonna say fifty stories. Not even fifty stories. The first one is considered lot lots of debate about this, but the first uh building that's officially sort of called a quote unquote skyscraper. The first modern skyscraper was actually built in 1885 in Chicago, Illinois. It's the home insurance building. And it rose to a whopping, hold on to your seat, you ready? Ten floors. Oh, see, and I was going to I was gonna go 11. I was going to say it was 11. We'll turn it up to 11. Um, and again, the reason that that was possible is it was now possible to, without a tremendous amount of effort, there were taller buildings, certainly this, but without a tremendous amount of effort, uh, get to the top without it just being a climb up stairs. stairs. So uh, one of the things that the, the invention of, of a safe passenger elevator, or which uh, perceived to be a safe passenger elevator, produces is the ability to build buildings that are taller, both in terms of places for offices and office, obviously places for homes. Yep. So, again, we're going to be talking about the historical what if here today. And the historical what if is going to be around what if this invention had not come along. So one of the things to quickly realize is, yes, you could have built 50 and 60 story office buildings or 50 and 60 story apartment buildings. But in practicality, nobody would be able to live there, or live work there, there. Or in, any, in any practical sense. In fact, in modern high rise real estate today, where are the expensive apartments, Lex? Uh, places like New York. Mm -hmm. In terms of ge geographically, but in terms of the, the vertical alignment of where they are in the building. Where is where is the most... Oh, they're on the top. They're, they're called what? They're called... Penthouses. Penthouses. In fact, the, the most expensive real estate in a building like that is the upper floors today for a number of reasons. Views and other things like that. In... The era before the elevator, where do you think the most expensive, let's say in a four, let's say a three to four, there were three to four, five story apartment buildings, tenements, that kinds of things in New York. Where do you think the most expensive apartment would have been found? Oh, on the ground floor. On the ground floor for the reason of it's easy to get to, easy to and easy to access. And so that, that's just one example of how things have morphed over time. So again, another one of the obvious impacts of having elevators and taller buildings is that we actually refer to, for downtown areas, we actually refer to those picturesque things that we see of them as their skylines, because they are vertically oriented. Mm -hmm. And now it's true that a number of cities do spread out horizontally. Yeah. But generally speaking, when you think of big urban areas and big urban areas globally, what do you think of? You think of... Skylines. And tall buildings. Uh-huh. And, uh, for example, uh, the tallest building in the world now, the Burj Khalifa, 160 stories, uh, spans literal, literally uh, thousands of feet into the end of the sky. Uh, in fact, it's um, the tallest elevator. It's the tallest building. It has, obviously, some of the tallest elevators in the world, but the actual height of the building itself is 828 meters or just over 2,700 feet. It has elevators inside that building. By the way, they're not the fastest elevators in the world because I saw something on this recently, but it has elevators in that building that can move at the speed of about 35 to 40 kilometers per hour. So obviously the thing I saw was in metric. So I'm converting that to, to, uh, to miles per hour. We're talking literally 20 to 25 miles per hour in terms of the speed of the elevator. The elevator can move faster than the fastest humans on Earth can 
run. Well, yeah. Yeah, this is also known as a building Alexis will never be in. Okay, and why is that, Lex? Uh, well, first of all, I am one of those people that... I wouldn't say I'm afraid of heights, but heights are not my favorite thing in the world. But, but the idea of being in an elevator that can move exponentially faster than the fastest human on Earth... It just doesn't sit well with me. <laughs> understood. Understood. So, as a result of the ability for cities to grow up, it's not that they don't grow out, but they don't have to grow out as much. So, just to put this in perspective, one of the interesting things about uh, looking at this and thinking about this, if you didn't allow, for example, people to live in elevated apartments, they would have to live in homes mm -hmm. that would be on the ground. Ground. And so, for example, in New York alone, we're a little over eight and a half million people. And let's say they lived in the average sized New York house, which are a living space, which is about 1,238 square feet per person for one story household. It would require the equivalent of them packed in this way, 105 central parks to house that many homes, uh, to house that many people. So how big would New York be if New York had to go out versus going up? New York City would be like, I, I can't do that math that, that well and, and that fast in my head. But New York City would be a good proportion of New York State at that rate. Yeah. In fact, the other interesting thing that I saw in this one documentary, uh, which sort of was the, the motivation for this, uh, for using this as an episode, was talking about Tokyo. Tokyo being still a large yeah, city. Yeah, this was flabbergasting. Yeah, T Tokyo is, is both a large, sprawling city. Uh, mm -hmm. covers you know covers a large territory, but obviously is a very vertical city as well. And the discussion there was it would require the entire landmass, the entire landmass of Japan, to house to, just Tokyo as, as a as a flat expression. Yeah, that that I I can't wrap my brain around that. Yeah, and so the so the result of that is that it's a pretty impactful thing that's happened in the last 160, 170 years with the growth of the elevator and the elevator enabling the skyscrapers enabling this. So again, we're talking about the historical what if here. So let's actually go down that path of what do you think would be the fate of modern cities or modern culture if you couldn't grow up, if you only could grow out? Well, I think you'd... I don't think you would have the, the the big cities that we think of in the world. We wouldn't have the New Yorks of the world, the Londons of the world, the Tokyos of the world, because they they couldn't extend, and because I think there would be this compete. I mean, we kind of have talked about this because we live in the Houston area, um, so we kind of Houston is kind of this, you know. I think I might have said this on the on the podcast before. It's like I can drive an hour from Houston to Houston because we have all these different suburbs that are kind of their own separate cities, but they're kind of known as within the Houston metroplex, you know, things like Sugarland, Pearland, you know, Katy, things like that. I think if you have this phenomenon of you can't go up, so you have to go out, it's what we know of as Houston doesn't really exist because I think those other settlements would, would exist already. So it's kind of just this hodgepodge mix match of the city can't establish itself because it's constantly hitting into those other small towns. It's Houston is, a, is always going to be a city, but it's not going to be that Houston type thing. It's just going to be that Houston is just almost another suburb because it's kind of in the middle of these other places that, grew up and because again because we can't go up and we have to go out it's just it just kind of becomes one of the many yeah and and the out part is actually an interesting thing because there are large urban areas houston's a good example of this los angeles is probably a another classic example of this there are a number of examples of this throughout the world and not just focusing on u.s examples but large sprawling uh, metropolises to tokyo we mentioned there and the issue about uh, having the sprawl be horizontal versus the sprawl being vertical is that the horizontal sprawl is a time component. How long it takes you to get from point A to point B. How far away you can live from where you work uh, is, is a function of 
your ability to cover that distance. And the mode that you use to cover that distance obviously varies uh, based upon how you're covering it. And so what actually happens here is you do reach a limit of just how far is how far because of what's reasonable. Or people have to choose and take jobs and take things that are only within a certain distance from where they live. And again, that's also constricted by the horizontal versus the vertical orientation. Right. And so to put that in perspective, that really does change things, as you might imagine, pretty dramatically, pretty quickly. And part of the way that it changes things is actually just in terms of tons of other economies that sort of come with that. Yes, uh, a, a vertical skyscraper, let's say just a vertical apartment building. So let's say a 35 or 40 floor vertical apartment building um, is fairly uh, efficient in terms of uh, the number of people that it can house, obviously, on the same amount of land. Uh, the office building next door is equally distant horizontally from everybody that's in the apartment building, uh, which would not be the case if everyone were spread out even horizontally for a building of that size. And the electricity and the trash and the water and all of the other infrastructure is also still, while it has vertical challenges, is still also horizontally located. Mm -hmm. uh, again, if you start expanding out these cities to the size that they would need to be horizontally, just the infrastructure build-outs become daunting, not to mention commuting and distance and the other things that are going on there. Yeah. Um, the other thing that popped in my head earlier is I'm going to make a Schoolhouse Rock, Schoolhouse Rock reference. I have the, the song Elbow Room in my head. Um, I mean, one of the things that people love about the fact that we have these big cities is that because we're building up and we're not having to build out there's there are these vast areas that are unpopulated so if people want to be away from the cities they can be they can be out where there aren't buildings we don't really have that if we just keep having to build out and out and out we kind of lose the the outskirts because we just have to keep expanding outwards. Correct. And and not only that, but one of the interesting things, again, I was I was inspired by this, the documentary that I saw here that was sort of one of the things that engendered this topic for me, was the fact that what makes, and particularly moving forward, we get concerned about things like impact on the environment, energy consumption over time. And so more of the ability, for example, for mass transit to be utilized versus less efficient, you know, Again, we've mentioned the city that, that we live in, Houston, a lot. It still very much is a motor city. It's a city that relies upon vehicles. Yes. Yes, we have mass transit in Houston, but not nearly as developed as you find in other cities of similar size or larger or even smaller. And as a result, uh, you know, the, the efficiency, the, the energy efficiency of Houston compared to other cities because of just things like mass transit comes into play. It's impossible for you to build efficient, effective mass transit systems the more you sprawl, just because it doesn't work as well because you don't have as much of the population density that's brought to bear. The same subway station serving four 40-story apartment buildings, the equivalent infrastructure to have a rail line that would support those equivalent number of people spread out over distance changes pretty... Yeah, that's not going to work. It, it, it eventually just doesn't work. It just doesn't work because the numbers don't work. Right. But then the, the other part of what's going on there is that as a result of that, we forget that an ele that elevators, both in terms of in office buildings or in residential buildings, are also an extension to a degree of a mass transit system. They are just a mass transit system in the vertical, mm -hmm. in a small horizontal space versus the, the, the equivalent mass transit system you would need that spreads out over a distance horizontally, if that makes any sense. Right. And so, again, the historical what if here is what would society look like today if there were no elevators? I have to say I struggle with even imagining what that would be. Yeah, I mean, you were kind of talking a little bit about the infrastructure. The thing that just the other thing that just popped in my head is agriculture. If we're having to expand out constantly because we can't go up, so we're having to go out, we're losing space for agriculture. So it's not just infrastructure, things with water and transit. It's also, do we have enough room to grow crops to sustain because we're having to build houses and roads and all the other infrastructure things that we can't 
accomplish vertically now, horizontally. Yeah, again, it's it's one of these things that seems small, right? The ability to uh, to lift people lift people up and down over distances, like we think of what an elevator does today. And uh, you know, there's uh, I happen to office in a two story building. As I say, mine's five. It has the two story building has an elevator. Now, part of the reason it has an elevator is for uh, accessibility. For those that are disabled, for you know, for other things that are where, it would it's not that big of a deal to go up and down stairs from the first to the second floor in that office space. Five story building. I used to work in a six story building on the sixth floor, and I would occasionally do the stairs up and down uh, each day just for the benefit the, of it. The, the exercise element of it. It was not convenient, but it was not beyond the level of practicality. As we mentioned, the first skyscraper was a full 10 stories, and you couldn't imagine, yeah, maybe people would work on the 10th floor and just understand the repercussions of that, but you you quickly hit limits that you can't get around. Yeah. And so just imagining what a society would look like where you can't stack work in addition to where people live... live you know, begins to be something that becomes just, again, I, I struggle to fully imagine what our world would be like if you didn't have that. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought up, because I've kind of had it in my head since we started talking about this topic, I'm glad you brought up, of course, we live in the U.S., so I immediately think of the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act. And, you know, I think if there were no elevators, you'd see buildings that were two, maybe three, maybe up to five stories tall that didn't have an elevator it was just assumed you, you lived in that building on the fifth floor you took the stairs again i, I kind of have big bang theory in my head of course you know the whole thing of the elevator's broken the entire time so they have to climb the stairs but because of the ada the americans with disabilities act would those even would those buildings even be allowed to exist because there's no alternate so the people that have those disabilities and can't go up the stairs can't go into those buildings. They can't work there. They can't live there. So would those be buildings even be allowed to be built? Correct. And well, the answer probably is yes. You would just decide that uh, you're now limited to where you can be employed if you have an access issue to you have to be on the first floor. floor. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, again, it, it's just one of those things we take it such for granted in terms of what it's done and what it's done, particularly in the last 100 years, that it's, again, I just find it almost impossible to imagine without. Now, having said that, we're also talking about one of those absurd what ifs in the context of it's hard to believe that sometime between 1853 and now, somebody else wouldn't have come along and said, I think I can make an elevator safe. safer or safe enough. Um, and so, you know, again, this is one of those, to some degree, I'll readily admit, almost absurd what ifs in the sense of it wouldn't have stayed this way forever. forever. But you know, again, the other thing that we've often talked about on situations like this where there's these small windows is that, okay, so maybe it's only 10, 15, 20 years more. It still comes. It's just, del it's not gone. It's just later. Later, it's delayed, even if it's slightly delayed. Even that probably does have an impact on the growth of cities uh, during the latter part of the 19th century, uh, how they work. And so it would still have an impact. Eventually, things would be overcome. And, you know, the things that, in fact, the challenge now is we're actually hitting sort of the next thing of how do you do a safe elevator because there's a limit to how long the cable can be on an elevator in the current configurations today to be safe. Right. So they're actually developing these new styles of elevators that can also move not just uh, vertically, but also can convert to move horizontally at places, and that can go over larger distance. So again, taking this idea of how do you transport the higher you go and the wider you go in, in some cities and, and urban instances into play. So again, it, again, we wouldn't be sitting here in 2021 going, how in the world can we get above five stories? Somebody would have figured that out. If they hadn't figured that out, we would have had a lot of other things that wouldn't have happened, like, I don't know, flight, uh, going to space, you know. Well, it's the... like when you did the 40 and sleep earlier. It's like, eh, this couldn't have been 1953, because not that long from now we're going to the moon. So, <laughs> yeah, again, so yeah, I understand that in some ways it, it's the absurd. But again, I think the other, the real world potential what if here is if you delay it for some number of years, 20, 10, 20, 30 years, 
you do delay that 10, 20, 30 years of development. Maybe things morph in a different way in terms of how society is and how cities. You would not have the, as many large cities as you do today if they were more sprawled out over space. If they were more horizontally, horizontally inclined, you don't have as many people being willing to move to cities because it's not the convenience that you're supposed to get by moving towards the city is, to some degree, lost. Not there, right. And so I think you definitely have that as something of a change even if it's just delayed by 15, 20, 30 years in terms of how it changes the growth of cities. Uh, and you, know, you change the timing and the growth of certain cities, again, the ripples that go out from here, they get to be pretty extreme. Yeah, because I think if we're talking about 1853, we're also talking about, we're right, as you mentioned earlier, in the Industrial Revolution. So you have factories and people moving to those cities. And so it kind of, it runs parallel and it's, it's, connected so it's it's it would have changed the dynamic because you wouldn't have had those people moving to those cities and yeah there would have been this i don't need to move i i'm comfortable where i am yep so i don't know if this has been the most profound fork in time we've ever done but can you think of anything else flex that just immediately pops to head on this sort of simple yet profound potential what if it, it's just interesting uh, the I've had a lot of mental images in my head and, and analogies and things. And the other thing that keeps popping in my head because I've I've done some um some traveling around around the state of Texas for for jobs in the past. And the other thing that keeps popping in my head is Dallas. If you've ever been to Dallas or visited Dallas, the fact that Dallas, if you're driving to it, just kind of seems to pop out of nowhere. It's like you're in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of nowhere, boom, there's Dallas. Um, and it's that skyline that's instantly recognizable as Dallas um, with a lot of skyscrapers in it. So it, yeah, it's just an interest. I'm, I'm struggling to wrap around in my head what, what cities that I know of and cities that are so iconic would look like if we didn't have skyscrapers. Yeah. I agree. It's, it's, it, again, it's just one of those weird what ifs that, uh, again, is not a realistic what if because we would have overcome this challenge. In fact, there were other systems that came along and competed with, uh, Otis and his safety break. Uh, but the timing of that, the timing of that invention, the timing of the ability to go vertical uh, was critical and it does have a critical impact. So hope you've enjoyed this little brief little, this was almost in that area of serious but whimsy at the same time, kind of a fork in time. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed that today. Again, we invite you to uh, visit our website at www.aforkintimepodcast.com. The A is important. Podcast is important. The internet, at least in terms of addressing, tends to be a pretty specific kind of place. And uh, there you can find information about the show, give us topical feedback, uh, suggestions for episodes. You can access our Patreon page there. You can buy merchandise. There's all kinds of other fun things you could do there. Anything else you want listeners to know, Lex, as we're closing out? I think that was everything. Yeah, I think it is, too. I certainly invite you also to check out our new podcast, The Room Where It Happened. You'll find information there also at the website. Until then, uh, we're going to invite you that uh, should you happen upon a fork in time, we have a strong suggestion. What would that be, Lex? Take it. Thanks for listening to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. Learn more and provide feedback by visiting our website at www.aforkintimepodcast.com. Connect to us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash a fork in time or follow us on Twitter at A F I T podcast. If you want to support the show financially, visit our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash a fork in time. We hope you will join us next time.